Hiya, welcome to episode 82 of Fear of a Black Planet. It is raining in London, and I love it. I love this time of year. It's now beginning to be proper autumn, leaves falling, drizzle, grey skies. I think the, the thing I love about this time of year is that you can you feel like you can hide away. That's what I like about it. It's sort of... Uh, you can kind of cosy up inside. I always feel in, in the summer and the bright sun, it's like a pressure to be happier. It's a pressure to be out and about. Um, whereas this time of year, it's a good excuse to just kind of be introspective, <laughs> it's like, um, which would be my default anyway. Um <clears throat> So it, it almost feels like you've permission to just not engage with the bullshit of the world and, and hide away. Anyway, that's my view on that. Um, I actually went out, out of London yesterday with a mate. We drove up to Cambridgeshire and had a uh, pub lunch. Um, and it was pissing it down, absolutely pissing it down. Um, but it good, in a way. It was nice. Uh, we haven't had rain like that in a long time, so um, I was chuffed about that. It actually cheers me up. It actively makes me happy, the rain. Um, and I'm, I don't know what that is other than possibly just familiarity. Um, I remember my, my, my grandparents used to have this place in, in Ayrshire and it would piss down pretty much 250 days of the year on the west coast of Scotland. And um, maybe that's what it is. Maybe my, it's just the associations with that. I used to stay in this room with a kind of skylight window and the rain would come on there and you'd be cosy inside. And I mean, it was proper rain as well, not just uh, a little bit of drizzle. It was always like this slanting, uh, windy rain. <laughs> A very dour part of the world in terms of the countryside, to be honest. It's Burns country, and it's uh, it's just sort of marshy fields and bogs, and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, but I kind of like that, the wind coming over the fields. Yeah, I have good memories of that, so maybe that's what it is. But I think it's also, it, it's more of an abstract thing. It's this feeling of you can hide away. That's what, that's, that's, that's what it comes down to. It's like you can hide away. There's a kind of, um, everything feels like it's an impressionist painting. That's what I like about it. It's like um, everything feels like a Monet painting in the rain. And so therefore... Maybe it's just this. Maybe it's just that the, the nervous. It's, it cools the nervous system. I feel in the, in especially in. I think what I'm talking about is London summers that I don't like, where it's like an assault of the senses and you can't hide from it. Whereas in the rain, there's just simply not as much information assaulting your senses. So it's almost like there's a filter on your senses and. Um, yeah, it sort of um, closes up the doors of perception in a good way, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, yeah, I'm quite chuffed about that, although I'm, I'm quite busy um, at the moment. I started a new course, and uh, which I could talk about, but I don't want to want to at the moment because I'm not right into it, and um, I want to develop ideas on the back of it. But... Um, I'm also, uh, I also just got commissioned to do a proper piece of journalism um, and getting paid for it. So after complaining about it for so long, I've now got it and now the pressure's on. So I'm feeling a bit of that pressure. Um, but I'm trying to remember this whole thing about scheduling that Jordan Peterson says about uh rewarding yourself you know it's like not not trying to turn everything into a persecution I do have a tendency you might be surprised to know to be slightly manic 
and then burn out. Um, so I'm trying to mediate it and say a little bit here, a little bit there, reward. So I'm going to try and get everything done by the afternoon today. So I'm, I'm trying to get this done relatively early. I haven't even had breakfast yet. I'm just trying to get things on the go. And uh, <clears throat> then I've got this course tonight and then I'll, ju I'll just chill out. I'll just enjoy it. You know, I'll just have an afternoon where I'll, I'll get a bit of writing done after this. And then after that, whatever happens is a bonus. And it, the rest of the day is for the wandering, meandering, arty farty imagination to have its have its cake and eat it. Um, so that's kind of, as I've probably said before, I can't work in the afternoons really. Like I can, but it's it, it it's about twenty five percent no matter what I do. It's drudging, you know. Um, and I, I but. In the in the mornings, if I get up early enough, like I did today, reasonably early anyway, um, I can get momentum. And I but come about midday or one o'clock, it's over really. And then and then there's like a, a bit of a boost about six o'clock. After about six or seven, my mind starts to wake up, inconveniently enough. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of accepting that rhythm, really. It's not that I'm completely useless in the afternoon, it's just that my brain goes to other things. It's a time for going for walks and uh, contemplation and maybe going to an art gallery or something like that, or going for a long walk. Um, or, or read, I mean, I can get a lot of reading done in the afternoons. It's just that the sort of uh, active part of the imagination or the act, or my kind of um, motivation for work, work kind of seems to to weigh to that uh, weigh at that point. Um, and again, that's another thing, isn't it? You just have to accept your rhythms. Like I can get, I, if I get up early enough, I can I can be quite productive. Um, it's just that there's a, a certain point in the after, spent about three o'clock. I mean, even when I'm I'm having to work shifts. About three o'clock in the afternoon, it's just like, oh, fuck this, you know. <laughs> uh, it just, it's just autopilot until you can kind of push through to the other side, you know. Um, but I suppose everyone has their rhythms, and the, and it's okay, it's okay to accept your rhythms, and actually, you become more productive if you do. Um, so maybe we need to get over this feeling of, or maybe I do, but I, th I can see in other people this feeling that we need to prove how productive we are and how hard we work um because i, I yeah actually this relates to something i, I wanted to talk more specifically about today it, my view of human nature is that we're not lazy actually i agree with chomsky on this that people um if left to their to their own devices will create meaningful lives for themselves and hence the critique of consumerism and, and the sort of uh, rampant workaholic capitalism. I'm not against capitalism, but I uh, this kind of yuppie uh, workaholism that we've all got to be working twelve hour days, and it's got to be painful, and you know that's the only thing that counts as work is bullshit. I do think I don't think that left our own devices, we become lazy, and I think we can, but I think there are other forces that cause that. Um, I think that our natural tendency in human nature is to is to want to create a meaningful life and perhaps that's what we need more of, you know. And maybe that's why there's so much misery in the world, is that we've got all this prosperity. That's a, that's one thing I was talking about with my mate yesterday when we were driving was and I don't have the answer to this. But how come it's sort of a paradox of in the economy we're living in 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 Western sort of Anglosphere countries, where we're hugely prosperous to the point of it almost being embarrassing. Um, but there's still a, it's not it's not so much like the 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 unease and the depression and the the frustration that causes things like Trump's election or Brexit. 
which I felt, by the way. I'm not saying that from looking on down high and mighty. I feel that. I feel part of that certain sphere of society which is sort of marginalised economically. I'm not talking about socially, I'm talking about economically. And that's, that's non-negotiable. I could tell you the facts of my life and you would see what I mean. And I think most people who I meet or who are, yeah, who I would interact with are in that bracket as well. So we've got all, we've got brilliant computers and technology and we've all got a smartphone and we've all got blah, blah, blah. And yet there's this clenching of the middle class in some way. I don't understand it. I'm not an economist, but there's some, it's like, how can we have all that prosperity without the sense of opportunity? And by the sense of opportunity, I mean the sense of the, I think it's something to do with the, the, with prosperity, one would subconsciously just expect that with that prosperity comes opportunity. But I think that with that, with the prosperity has not come opportunity. It's that it has just come a kind of mundanity. And I think that's at the bottom of a lot of frustration in the air. It's certainly at the bottom of a lot of mine. I think if I if I if I'm thinking back on it over the last few years, that this sense of it's sort of a, a meaninglessness that comes with it, not because it's inherently meaningless to, to, to look for prosperity. It's the right thing to do. And I'm not anti-capitalist, as I've said before, but if there's... I think you, you, we would normally expect an increase in meaningfulness. And I suppose what I mean is freedom, self-determination that comes with prosperity, but we've got prosperity without the self-determination that is really what we find valuable in prosperity. And technology, so we've got all this technology, but there's something lacking in the in the in the self-determination that you would that you would sort of unconsciously expect, that you would just automatically expect from that. And I think that there's an anger that comes from that. That regardless of our prosperity it doesn't empower us in the way that you would just naturally expect, you know. We still have to work shit jobs and, and um, it's still a very confined idea of human nature that governs society in some way. Personally, I think that's to do with consumerism because consumerism and, and propaganda go hand in hand in my view because it's all about manipulating people. It's about, it's about um, it's about <clears throat> taking away their agency really, advertising and all that. Or it's, you know, the, the the really what they call Rolls Royce propaganda techniques, it's a phrase I learned recently from my mate, is making you think like you've got agency, or 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 even allowing you to exercise your agency so that you you don't feel like you're being manipulated, and so you almost feel empowered, but you're still doing what someone wants you to do anyway. I suppose social media is a good example of that. Where we feel a sense of empowerment that the that the that the technology is sort of helping our um, our self determination in a way we're able to assert aspects of ourselves that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, but that feeling is really being harnessed for a greater feeling, which is obviously uh, kind of harvesting large amounts of uh, marketing data and the whole scrolling thing of. Uh, making you, even though it's your choice, it's sort of like they know, you know, it's you're being manipulated to keep scrolling, your attention's being captured. And it's a bit like what I was saying about the David Foster Wallace critique of, of the television era. The scrolling era is just the same. It's, a, it's really about attention, so it doesn't really matter. They can put something on like Mad Men, for instance, which is a kind of incisive critique of advertising culture. But all that's doing is making us feel better and more insightful about what's happening to us. It's not actually liberating us in any way. So I think maybe that's what this paradox of prosperity is, is that 
we've got uh, the feeling of liberation without the without really the spiritual benefits that the soul gets from liberation, that sense of meaningfulness and uh, self-determination. So there, there's a difference between choice and self-determination in a way, or that, um, it's an interesting, I don't have the answers, I, I'm just putting it out there. I, uh, because the, the, the point about choice is, 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 a, is the right one. We, choice is what defines us as human beings. We are defined by our freedom. And at least whether that's, you know, whether free will exists in a scientific sense or not, I think it would be difficult to say that it would be difficult to, to give a definition of what it means to be human without emphasizing choice. But there's a difference between the, the, the consumerist version of choice and the the meaningful sense of agency. Maybe the maybe what we call choice in consumerism isn't really choice at all. Maybe that's what it is. It's it's the it's the semblance of choice. But we're not um I think that the the real sense of choice in human agency is the choice is self overcoming. It's the ability to overcome ourselves in some way. To, to not be a victim of our own urges and impulses. And I think that personally there, there, there's some kind of dopamine type chemical that's released in that moment when we're able to make that kind of choice, a sort of the, a choice for what Mill would call a kind of higher happiness as opposed to just fulfillment of basic desires, that there's a sense of meaningful choice and and through that we get we get some it's that it's in those moments that evolution happens put it like that and that there's a reward system deep in our psyche for that um and it's difficult and but the the difficulty is what creates the meaningfulness and the the choice that's given to us in modern society in the in in the version of prosperity that I'm talking about is not that so it's a kind of fake version of, of, of agency. And consumerist choice is really a form of slavery in a way. And I'm not saying that as some kind of like patronizing culture critic. I'm saying that as someone who's in it. You know, I'm not any different. I st I, one of the things I was talking about yesterday with my mate as well is how I hate Twitter, but I can't get off it. Like... So, you know, if there is a conspiracy, as Bill Burr says, of uh, goat, goat fucking Bilderberg group types that will go to a mountain and shake each other's willies, if there is that kind of conspiracy, they would laugh at this kind of thing, this podcast. They would laugh because it's, they, they, it's not in any way a threat to them. Because as long as I keep talking about my paranoia and my suspicions of them, but I'm still using their technology, I'm still using Twitter. They, 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 it's a chuckle for them, you know. Um, I'm not saying there is a conspiracy like that, but sometimes it makes a lot of fucking sense. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's I can't get off Twitter, even though I know it's shit, even though I know it's really bad for me, even though it makes me miserable. For some reason, I can't pull myself. I can't overcome myself in that way. Uh, and it's, it's it's a question that goes way beyond just mere self-discipline. It's, it's it's something that's actually eroding the humanity for exactly the reasons I'm talking about. That I'm not exercising that that true agency, and this relates again to the to the Jordan Peterson stuff about meaning. That it's not about happiness; it's about meaning. And I think that. That's it. I think that that's what appeals to me about it, what he says. And that's what I've always felt. It's just he's given words to it that it's what gives us meaning which truly liberates us. And that's... I'm just thinking aloud here, so just give me a second. 
And that's the difference, yeah. That's the difference between... And that's what's lacking. So all the prosperity that we have seems like, you know... It, so, for instance, when you think, if I had a million dollars, like that m and that early m M&M rap song, if I had a million dollars, it's that sort of thought. So if I had this X level of prosperity, like all our forefathers, if they had even contemplated having the kinds of prosperity that we have, they would have thought immediately that that would make their life, that would liberate them in some way. And by that I mean give them a sense of freedom and meaning. There's a reason why we value freedom, because it's that we can we can then be the source of our own meaning. It's a, it's 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 part of the human drive. I feel that that's really the, the evolutionary drive in terms of human nature, is to be the source of our own meaning. But what we've been given is all the prosperity that we thought would give us that, but it doesn't. It doesn't liberate us. We're not agents. We're not self-determining. We're still almost even more subject to forces of manipulation and um, control than we were pre-industrial revolution. I know that's a controversial thing to say. I'm not saying that that was better. I'm just saying that there's something paradoxical about the so-called progress that we live in, and I'm not saying that I want to go back. Of course I want to have medical technology, dental technology, this kind of technology that I'm using right now. I'm happy to have it all, but why is it that it hasn't given us that thing that we would sort of almost instinctively expect it to? And I think that I think that that's certainly a source of my anger in, in, in a lot of ways of the culture, and I think that possibly that's what it, people are feeling now, is that, hang on, I've got this prosperity, but why don't... Why am I not any more self-reliant and, and yeah, what, why can't I create meaning on my own terms still? Why do I still have to fight through this drudgery and, and kind of like, uh, and why does, and so it's like <clears throat> that kind of empty feeling that you get in the supermarket or online shopping where what you're really looking for is that buzz of self-determination, of having given your life meaning in some way on your own back. But what's really happened is the more you exercise that quote-unquote choice, the the less self-determined you feel because you're really being manipulated. You really have. You really know that you're you're not being you're not liberating yourself through choice that that choice is actually a kind of fake choice because you're not the source of that meaning. You're, it's all according to fashion. It's all according to uh, algorithms that are uh, uh, feeding you certain things. I get this on YouTube as a good example. Like In my head on YouTube, I go, okay, yeah, no, no, I've got, I'm having breakfast here, so I'll just watch a YouTube thing and that'll, you know, and there's a sort of comfort. Like I'll find something that I like but then immediately I'm bombarded with distracting, clickbaity things when I go into the main page of YouTube that are designed for me, that I've watched already. So I am distracted, and then I start this like mind blank, like what was I looking for before? What was that feeling? It's like I kind of I'm distracted from myself in a really sinister way, because obviously you cannot be manipulated if you if you are a self determining person if you're if you're exercising a kind of higher level agency and choice, you cannot be subject to that kind of manipulation. So people can't sell products on mass, which is really what's driving the economy is this kind of mass level of, of sales. We cannot be turned into the engine of a consumerist economy, which maintains a certain class of elites. And you know, with with the a lot of this um, white guilt virtue signaling is tied into this, in my view, because with the fall of colonialism, and which is basically, and the fall of slavery, in I'm talking in kind of epoch terms here. With that, and of course I'm supporting it, but with that has meant that. 
people at the top can no longer harness a manpower for their own in the kind of physical sense but consumerism has replaced colonialism is what I'm saying it's just another mechanism for keeping a top tier comfortable and not having to work whereas the rest of us all kind of it, it's it, we're just fuel for the engine now that's I don't that sounds really conspiratorial I'm not even saying that in an angry conspiratorial Alex Jones kind of way it just seems kind of obvious to me um and one of the big um, salves that keeps us going is, is an idea of choice and freedom. <clears throat> and what's really sad is no matter how much I talk about it, you, you know, I, I'm sure I'm not enlightening anyone here, really. We all know it, but we're all, we all participate in, in it anyway. Um, and I, but I, I think that the, the way to fight it is to, is to insist on creating your own meaning. But the thing is, is that you have to get used to the fact that that's not going to be fun. That's what I'm getting used to. Is it's not being free is not fun, but it but it is rewarding. Um, so that there's a there's a fake choice where I can sit on Twitter on YouTube and just scroll and, and allow the the algorithms to dictate the next two hours of my life and then come out feeling dirty, or I can wrench myself from it and force myself to do something that my my kind of instincts don't like or that I feel lazy about but then get the reward of that freedom and evolve uh, you know so but and I think that, that that's really what we hunger for but we're living in an economy which pretends to give it to us while actually it sells slavery through the back door of the rhetoric of freedom. And so the, if I had to really, yeah, if I had to really kind of explain it, it would probably be this difference between the two types of choice, between self-determining, meaningful self-determination through choice and just consumerist choice. I'm going to write that down, actually, yeah. and consumerist choice <clears throat> yeah so anyway uh, did anyone see that um, press conference that Kanye and, and Trump did in the White House Oval Office pretty surreal really um, I've talked about Kanye and I've talked about Trump before and I am not an anti-Trumper and I'm not and, and I kind of like Kanye um, having said that there was something faintly ridiculous about the whole thing um, they're both very similar people they're they're smart but they're not book smart so they're not they're not there having a literary discussion and they both tend to say stupid shit off the top of their heads but it comes from a smart place, I think. Um, yeah, I. Uh, it was ridiculous because, in in a way, I mean, if I, I, in a way, it was sort of refreshing, and I'll get to that. But the ridiculousness of it was that they weren't really saying it; they were sort of talking past each other. <clears throat> And Trump kept doing that. That's really nice. That's really nice. That's all he had to say, really. He's not a very articulate guy. And and I can tell that, that and maybe rightly, that people are annoyed by that. You know, Obama was a particularly articulate man, although he wasn't a great speechifier in the way people say he was. But he was articulate and measured, and he thought about what he was going to say before he said it, but almost to the point of being annoying. And that's probably the big reason for having Trump now. But um, one thing I did notice about Trump was that he he's watching everything with very astute eyes. So I could see an intelligence there, which was indisputable. Um, even though I, I, I feel this frustration with the guy when... 
when I when I look at a political leader, I want them to be articulate. I want them to be a kind of Churchill, you know, um, a kind of Renaissance man. I want them to be able to say insightful things, be literary uh, and statesmanlike. And so, in that sense, it was ridiculous and also disappointing that the, that what should be an office which represents those things. Um, was kind of reduced to kind of uh, reality TV, I guess. However, there was something refreshing about it because I prefer that than the kind of Blairist, Obamaist, everything's um, focus grouped and pre planned and no one says anything and everyone keeps on message. One of the great things about Trump there was that he just let Kanye riff about anything, and he said, and Kanye at least twice I think said things that were the opposite of of what Trump thinks. He said something about Colin Kaepernick and you know being really positive, wanting him to get involved in this and have a dialogue. You know, Trump's been very critical of Colin Kaepernick and that whole taking a knee thing. And he also said something about the stop and search in, in Chicago and said he wants to get rid of it and to help Chicago. Uh, and Trump's obviously a supporter of that and very supportive of the police. But I've got to give it credit to Trump. Like they were, All the journalists there were trying to to goad it into some kind of conflict. So how can you be sitting here? And, and Trump's like, well, you know, I don't care. You know, so he can talk for me anytime and I'm open to anything. There is something refreshing about that. I'm sorry, there is something positive about that. Um, that to me is a kind of progress because it, I found the whole spin doctoring, focus grouped, premeditated nature of politics in the last 25 years very stifling. And so there is a sense that, as you know, I obviously would prefer them to be sitting there discussing Kant. And, and and the true meaning of, of of a liberal society, you know, and then with a discussion about E.M. Foster or something like that. But I'm not going to get that. But th there's something less philistinic about that shit show of a press conference than there is Hillary Clinton just saying bland platitudes. That's even more philistinic to me. So whatever people, I think this is where I I, I differ from 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 other people that would call themselves liberal in, in regard to Trump and stuff like that. It's just more of a threat to me. I think it's more of an erosion of public life to have bland, platitudinous, focus-grouped, uh, premeditated, staged press conferences where nobody really says anything controversial, everything's risk-averse. I think it's it's much more refreshing and enriching to have a conference like that where it's like just free flow, <laughs> and and something could really blow up, you know. Um, something I real I like about Trump. I have to admit, I like that about Trump. He's willing to go like that, and that and I know what people would say. They would say, "Well, so it's okay. What about certain situations where it's just so dangerous?" They say, "Well, actually, I think that in the long term, however, you know, you could say like the North Korea thing." You know, I was just like everyone else when he was tweeting, you know, what was it, Little Rocket Man and all that. I was like, oh, fucking hell. He's just like, he's unleashing here. But in the long run, you could argue that the Obama technique of just sort of saying blandified, platitudinous things was more dangerous because it didn't, it didn't, it doesn't address things. It's, uh that you can become so risk averse that you don't take action at the right times and you don't show force and you don't draw boundaries at the right times. Uh, so I'm not advocating being incautious on serious issues, but I am saying that actually you can, there's a point where you can be so cautious that it's, it's, it's even more dangerous. And that's what I've actually felt over the last, and I feel that about the culture in general, all this PC stuff, it's the, it comes down to the risk aversion at the bottom of it, which I feel is dangerous. And it's related to what I was just talking about, actually, in terms of the difference between consumerist choice and self-determining meaningful choice. 
The self-determining meaningful choice requires risk. It requires suffering. It requires sacrifice and difficulty and struggle. And it's going to cost. It's, it requires a cost. Consumerist choice requires no cost to you. You know, it's just clicking and, and you know, it does, it, there's no sacrifice in that in that experience of choice. And so and therefore no meaningfulness. And that's part and, and this whole culture of, of risk aversion is at the heart of it, whether it's political correctness, consumerism, bland spin doctoring politics, um the sort of meaningless prosperity that we have as opposed to as prosperity. I'm you know, I'm not against prosperity, I'm not advocating you know, some uh regressive return to the to the land or something i'm just saying that the, the prosperity is pointless if it doesn't make our life more meaningful and a large part of I, I, maybe it's a symptom a, 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 a really good example of a symptom this risk averse politics we cannot and 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 i know people would be people uh, prefer stability to conflict but I don't. I don't. I'm not in favour of war, but I'm also not in favour of bland, meaningless stability because, it, unfortunately, it's through conflict that we make progress, that we become, that we live meaningful lives. So the ta I mean, so and again, I, I, I'm not saying this in a blase way. I don't want to ha live in a world where war is the dominant practice. But the task is to find a way of of negotiating conflict without that. And I think we can do it. I think I am optimistic about the human race. I think that, that that is one of the the great promises of a technological society is that perhaps we can engage in conflict that isn't going to result in in horrifying annihilation. But <clears throat> risk aversion is not the answer, is what I'm saying. Uh, for one, it's fake. It, it isn't, it just, you know, human nature is never going to be like that. But the main thing is, is that it, it, it's nihilistic. It, it, it results in meaninglessness so that we, we sacrifice meaningful uh, flourishing and, and we sacrifice our true human potential in the name of avoiding conflict, in the name of a kind of a soppy pacifism, which isn't really a pacifism. A true pacifism is is not shying away from conflict. It's about um, f negotiating a conflict, finding roots out of conflict uh, and being prepared to go to war, but doing everything in your power not to. Um that would be the true peace, peacefulness. That's a true way of peace, rather than risk aversion. And 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 I guess that's goes back to what I've been talking about about the relationship between virtue signaling and political correctness. Is that uh, there's a lot of m mediocrity and virtue signaling rhetoric that goes along with risk aversion, as if risk aversion is the opposite of war, as if risk aversion is the opposite of sadness, as if risk aversion equals happiness. But it doesn't. What makes happiness is meaningfulness, and that requires risk. And sometimes the only way you can maintain peace is to risk war. It's a paradox, I guess. I can't remember. There was. I think it was there a... I think it's like a, a Viking saying or something like that I read years ago that That in order to, or maybe it's a Celtic thing. It's like one of these ancient civilization uh, proverbs that you that sometimes in order to, I can't remember it exactly, but it's basically the gist of it is in order to defend your values, you might have to do something that violate. You might be have to be prepared to violate those values in one instant in order to maintain those values in the long term. And that is really the paradox 
of peace. What isn't peaceful is risk aversion, risk aversion, risk aversion, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, war, and we're not prepared for it. And that's what happened with Obama's policy in the Middle East. Risk aversion, risk aversion, risk aversion, you know, not getting involved, the opposite of Bush, whatever we're doing, it's the opposite of Bush, and then suddenly ISIS, and then we've got fucking murders on the streets of Europe. Um, which somehow have died down in the last two years. So I don't, I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I just thought it was interesting what happened with Kanye. Um, and yes, I would be, I would absolutely prefer to have a statesman-like display of literary flair and, and, you know, be like an episode of the West Wing. And that Kanye was much more an articulate artist. He's a furiously creative person, and, and as Dave Chappelle said, he's a genius, and I agree with that. But he, there are a lot of faults with the guy, and, and, and I wish that he was more book smart in a way, because I think it would give him a lot more power as an artist. And I think that he would be reaping the benefits of it now if he was able to explain his ideas uh, in that in from that using the resource of, resources of a, of a of a kind of more literary understanding of of life but you know I as I say I, I, my point is basically I would prefer that to risk aversion because it's nice and 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 fluffy and so-called peaceful uh, risk aversion can seem it's uh, decadent it's sta it stagnates what what creates meaningfulness and what create and therefore human flourishing is a willingness to to risk certain things for a higher set of values so maybe that's the difference between in incautious risk and meaningful risk the, the incautious risk and this is this is a legitimate criticism of Trump actually this is a specifically legitimate criticism of, of, of Trump which is that sometimes it appears that he's he's willing to throw caution to the wind just for its own sake I don't agree with that you have to do it for a more meaningful higher purpose that you're you're doing it because you have a hierarchy of values and you want to sacrifice perhaps the some values that are lower down the hierarchy for some values that are higher up the hierarchy. That's meaningful. Whereas just being incautious and saying whatever comes to your mind for the sake of it. Um, a good example of that would have been his response to Charleston. You know, he just wasn't thinking, you know, and he was thinking about not pissing off his base and not seeming like he was a soppy liberal and pandering to the press. But come the, the product of that was that it was very easy for people to, to, to paint that as an apologism for, for, for brutal terrorism and Nazism. And it was stupid, and he was wrong. And that's an example of, of, his, of his incaution in thinking and it not being governed by values. But that does not mean automatically that the bland, platitudinous version of politics in Clinton and Obama and Tony Blair and Cameron and all these types, where it's just government by spin and PR, that the whole... This is what I think that we are living in the religion of marketing, which is, by its nature, a religion of risk aversion. It's maximizing product for the minimum amount of risk. And that's that's the death of society, in my view, because it's it's only through risking certain things we value for certain things we value more that we can be grow um, and so a lot of and, and a lot of this um, anti-war anti this anti that anti-fascist kind of rhetoric is actually just fake it's risk aversion masquerading as virtue Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I've blabbered on too much, and I've got to get going and uh, have some breakfast and sort my shit out. But uh, thanks for listening. That's episode 
82 and I'll be back next week for episode 83. Thank you very much. <laughs>